Rogers TV Ottawa. Most of us probably imagined we would have found ourselves on the other side of COVID-19, uh, the pandemic by this time. However, Omicron had different ideas. And throughout these difficult times, the city has had to continue to make important decisions on our behalf. Uh, this show gives you an opportunity to connect with your ele elected officials and, of course, for them to connect with you. Welcome, everybody, to Ward Updates 2022, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with Ottawa City Councillors. We're going to discuss a number of important issues during these discussions, uh, issues that affect you, your family, and members of your community. My guest today is Riley Brockington, City Councillor for, for River Ward. Riley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. And I, I want to start off, Riley, more on a personal level and just ask you, you know, how have things been? I, as I said off the top, I, I'm sure you imagined, uh, as well as most of us, that we'd be, we'd be through this pandemic. And then, of course, we had this new Omicron wave that is that has set us back. So on a personal level, how have you been dealing with with it, uh, you and your family? Well, thank you so much for asking, Derek, and, and having me on the show today. Uh, my daughters and I are well. This has been a long journey, as you've said. It's uh, quite the marathon and um, getting a little fatigued with the uh, ongoing challenges of COVID. But um, we're well and trying to keep positive and, and getting through this winter and really looking ahead, hopefully, to a better 2022. Riley, on a professional level, how has the pandemic affected your role as, as a city councillor? Well, certainly it's twofold. One is the ongoing concern of the, my residents in River Ward to make sure that their needs are met during the pandemic. We've certainly focused from um, sort of basic needs, uh, concerned with people's basic needs to vaccination. Vaccination has been our main focus for quite some time now, for about a year, making sure people get vaccinated, making sure they have information. Again, the first part of vaccination was sharing information about the role of vaccinations, the type of vaccinations, why vaccinations, why, why they're so important. And now it's sharing information about locations for booster shots and, and how to get uh, their, their dose if, if they're mobility impaired or have other challenges. So we continue to pivot and shift during this marathon, but really yeah. sharing information and getting people vaccinated has been the, the immediate focus right now. Riley, how has the pandemic affected the way that you communicate with your constituents? You know, you obviously there's always been some issues. You may have some constituents that that go away for a while, and you know they don't, or you may have some some older constituents, or, or depending on somebody's you know economic situation, they may not have access to technology. So, how has it affected the way that you can communicate with your constituents to this pandemic? Yeah, the, the main challenge right from the start is the lack of in-person uh, meetings or, or functions, events in the ward where you can speak to people one-on-one, -on -one, but also a larger crowd if I'm giving an update on city issues or just speaking to whatever subject matter uh, that day's about. Uh, so a much greater reliance on social media. Uh, this term of council in my office, we started with a monthly e-newsletter. Um, and we still maintain printed matter. We, we do want to rely on sort of fast, efficient social media to get key points out. But we do realize, as you've said, not everyone is connected online. So we still rely on sort of old fashioned printed material. But key thing is, is making sure people have relevant current information. Things change on a daily basis. And we want to make sure that people in the ward are, uh, are aware of what's going on. Um, it's, as I said, it's affected everyone uh, right across the community. But in, in your ward, what are some of the, the success stories? Because we've seen some positive stories. So tell us a little bit about some of the, the positive stories that are happening in River Ward. Yeah, we have a very diverse population in River Ward. We're an urban 
ward of 50,000 people. Uh, basically, the Rideau River corridor is the spine with communities on both sides from the airport all the way up to Carling Avenue. So we have a number of community organizations that assist particularly people or communities in need that existed well before the pandemic. And many of them rolled up their sleeves and went above and beyond the call of duty, being present uh, on a daily basis, making sure people had basic provisions, were getting to doctor's appointments, uh, were getting food. Um, even my office in the first part of COVID, we were doing a significant amount of proactive telephone calling and outreach to make sure uh, older citizens were being taken care of, uh, people who were living alone were still getting to appointments. We wanted to make sure people weren't being cut off. We had that social isolation, but we wanted to make sure they were still being connected for their basic provisions. But a lot of these groups stepped up. Um, school boards were purchasing Chromebooks. The Ottawa Public Library produced or uh, procured Chromebooks to make sure families who were now learning at home had the electronic means and the technology to stay connected. That was very important given the number of families in my ward who quite frankly just couldn't afford to buy this. So. A lot of people stepped up with time, effort, energy, resources to make sure people were being fed, to make sure their, their basic needs were being met. They were getting the doctor's appointments. They were getting to vaccine appointments. Um, and then the whole learning from home dynamic, which was very difficult yeah. for many households, especially with families with multiple children, you want to make sure they were covered off. But it was a struggle at the beginning, but certainly things are much smoother now. Absolutely. Well, let's turn our attention to to City Council and uh, the work that you do on City Council. You know, this is the the final term. Uh, what are your goals as as we sort of wind down this this final term here? Yeah, in twenty twenty one, we had certainly the official plan, which was a culmination of of close to three years of work that was approved by a very healthy margin of City Council at the very end of, of that year. We will be now transitioning to what's called a comprehensive zoning bylaw, which will dictate how that zoning and development is um, facilitated over the coming years and decades. One thing I'm really focusing on is, is the revised transportation master plan, which is basically the blueprint for how major transportation projects will unfold in years to come. And a particular piece of the TMP that I'm interested in is active transportation. So sidewalks, multi-use pathways and cycling infrastructure. And despite River Ward's proximity to the downtown, uh, our infrastructure for those three that I just listed is certainly does not meet my needs or the needs of my community. So I've tried to encourage the communities in River Ward to uh, pay very close attention to active transportation. If we want vibrant 15 minute neighborhoods where people can walk to um, not just parks, but uh, you know stores, retail outlets, and we reduce our dependence on cars, we really need to have pedestrian and cycling networks that are alive and well in our residential communities. So, that will be a focus uh, in this year as well, and I'm looking forward to that. But there are those city level issues that you talk about. Certainly public transportation continues to be a challenge, not just with the LRT, which seems to be stabilizing, but to continue to provide reliable bus service in an affordable uh, manner uh, continues to get the Transit Commission's attention and ongoing dialogue. Yeah, and certainly, you know, when it comes to public transportation, you mentioned reliable, uh, affordable, it has to be convenient, it, it has to be all of those things. You know, December, yeah. you you rolled out, you know, free transportation, which, you know, is an, an interesting time to do it. You have a lot of students off and that, and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, you've had a huge revenue shortfall. I just, many people look at that 2.5% increase in in transit fares and, and, and they wonder, you know, is it, Considering the loss of ridership, is it the right thing to do? Uh, what do you think on, on those and that basis? And, and how are we going to encourage people to, to come back to public transportation? Because it becomes a habit for people, right? All of a sudden, they've turned to their cars and that, you know, that vehicle becomes a, a habit. So 
ways to encourage people to come back and you know you just give me a sense on where you stand on that on that uh, transit fare hike sure so the timing couldn't be worse um, with all the challenges that we've experienced with lrt and and the shutdown that we saw you know two months shutdown uh to basically um as january 1st approached the timing was poor. However, the system needs to be financially sustained. And that comes from uh, two sources, fair revenues from passengers and the taxpayer. So that's the challenge that uh, we have on the Transit Commission. I do believe the long-term financial plan needs to be reviewed. There needs to be a significant discussion about how this uh, can be maintained and, and affordable for our riders. I honestly don't think that the cost of transportation is the number one factor that draws passengers. And I know that might be controversial for me to say, I think the most reliable, or sorry, I think the most, the number one factor to draw passengers is a reliable, safe system. And if OC Transpo can continuously provide a reliable system, which it struggled with, not just LRT, but buses as well. We've seen significant challenges with the bus system over the years. That will draw people. They know they can get to where they need to go, whether it's school or work, other personal functions. The bus has to show up at the scheduled right. time. And it doesn't matter what it costs. If I can't rely on the network, I'm gonna look at other modes of transportation to get me where I need to go. Yeah, so, you know, outside of, of fares and, and making it affordable, um, reliability, as you said, is huge. But is there any way or, or any thought on your part or, or and, and perhaps some other uh, colleagues on, on City Council of, of, of more incentives in order to increase ridership once we start, you know, getting back to perhaps not normal, but a new normal? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that. I, I don't know what gimmicks or, or other ideas uh, we can or other transit systems in the world can come up with. I think you need a reliable system consistently. And I think that needs to be the number one focus for all transit commissioners when we meet every month is how are we making the system more reliable, more stable, more consistently uh, reliable for our citizens. And if we're slipping and if we're not meeting those goals, we have to focus on that every month. That is sort of the macro level priority I believe the Transit Commission needs to have. There's some murmurs or debate about whether there should actually be a cost to passengers to ride the bus. There are some on council who would like to offer free transit permanently. Uh, in this city, that obviously has not been the case in the past for any uh, time after a month. We just went through a month. But, you know, those loss in revenues have to be made up elsewhere, and that will require a significant conversation if that's seriously going to be debated. Um, but, you know, we, we do live in a, uh, we've declared a climate emergency. We want less reliance on fossil fuel vehicles. We have a electric powered LRT system. We've bought first round of, of revised fleet will be battery powered. So we're trying to get our public transit system moving in that direction. And ultimately we want people to use modes of transit that will not contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever we can do to get people in public transit, that's the goal. Uh, reliable transit definitely has to be the main goal, but also the fares can't be out of control. The fares have to be reasonable and affordable. And again, that will also be a main discussion point going forward. Riley, you mentioned, um, you know, city revenues. The the pandemic's been a huge hit on 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 city revenues. Uh, you know, it, it's important. How do you make up for those city, you know, th those revenue shortfalls? You know, I look yeah. at a three percent tax increase, and as a property, you know, somebody that's paying property taxes, I'm happy to see that three percent. You know, that it's not any higher than that. But I wonder, are we putting off the inevitable eventually? where you know, maybe the next generation or even in five years when I still own a home, we're gonna have to increase those, th those property tax percentages a great deal. Um, can you speak on that for us? Yeah, COVID certainly has hit the bottom line. Public uh, transit revenues have been hit the hardest, over $100 million loss in revenues. 
and then you get uh, significantly below that the parks and recreation, the, the fees that people pay to, uh, you know, sign up for courses and, and uh, recreation programming and then other lost revenues. To date, uh, municipalities have been fairly fortunate. The provincial and federal governments have provided basically bailouts to municipalities across this province and, and country, but that is gonna run out at some point. Um, I don't believe that raising taxes is the solution to every problem. Uh, I do believe 3% cap is reasonable, which is basically 2% for inflationary pressures and a dedicated 1% to our backlog of infrastructure needs in the city, which is still not being met. Um, so I think when you have a budget of $4.5 billion, uh, the more challenging thing to do, other than raise taxes, which for me is the lazy way, is to refocus your priorities and ask right. yourselves, what are the services that our citizens need? And uh, can we save some money within that budget and re reallocate that to other uh, you know, shortfalls or to the, uh, the infrastructure deficit that exists? or other priorities. So um, my concern is how long COVID lasts and how long revenues that took a hit from COVID will continue to not really get back to the pre-COVID level. So there was a very ambitious uh, target, passenger target for OC Transpo, they think. <laughs> That's uh, putting December. it mildly, yes. Yeah, it's, it's not based on I think reality, and I was quite outspoken during the budget process, but they think we're going to be back to 100% ridership pre-COVID this December. Uh, I don't think that's the case, especially with how slow the federal government is going back to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned walkability and, you know, the new sort of that that new plan. And when it comes to, you know, planning and zoning and that kind of thing, it really mm -hmm. comes down to, you know, Ottawa City Council working with developers and really putting in regulations that kind of force developers to make sure that the communities that, that they're developing in do have that walkability score. And I, I did some research and, you know, as a whole, the city of Ottawa has a, a walkability score of about 45 out of 50 when it comes to trans, uh, sorry, 45 out of 100. When it comes to transit, 50 out of 100. Our biking scores is very high when you compare to other cities across the country at about 64 out of 100. But uh, how can we help improve those numbers, especially working with developers? Because as I said, the, de the developers will just do whatever they can in order to, to put in as many units as they can in any in any particular area. Is it not, Riley, uh, up to City Council to put those things in place to make sure we have sidewalks? I mean, we have communities with zero sidewalks in this city. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does really do lie with the City of Ottawa. Developers are focused on their parcel of land for their development. And while they do contribute development charges to various pots, they're not responsible what's happening a few blocks away when there are infrastructure gaps. So that's why I mentioned the importance of the active transportation piece of the transportation master plan that's being revised this year, now in phase three. And uh, this is very important for me because I want people to be able to get around in their neighborhoods. I want them be, to be able to travel to the abutting neighborhood and I don't want them to have to rely on their car my challenge is I have neighborhoods that are up to 70, 80 years old that were built to 70 and 80 year old conditions at that time. Where I live in Mooney's Bay, we were built basically in the 1960s, still car centric. So we have to modify existing infrastructure with the modern day infrastructure. And that's very expensive. It can't all be done all at once and it has to be done in phases. So when there's a major road project, you then rebuild the road with a redesign that includes biking and walking infrastructure. So this isn't gonna happen overnight. It has to be budgeted for and it has to be planned for. I just wanna push this further, faster, sooner, because that's what we want. As we know, a healthy, vibrant neighborhood allows people to get out, walk, bike, jog, all those things that people wanna do and if you don't have the infrastructure, people don't sit, feel safe doing it. So that's right. the dilemma that we have is we know what we want to do. We just need the funds to get it done. 
um, in in River Ward, you have an abundance of green space. I mean, it's yeah. so it, it's such a beautiful area. I mean, you know, every part of the city is a beautiful area, but you do have abundance of of green space. You know, when you when you look at it overall, uh, you mentioned Mooney's Bay, for instance. Mooney's mm -hmm. Bay is that sort of hub of activities, right? For leisure activities, yeah. for festivals, for people that have gathered. You know, and it's been restricted. Right. So I just wonder, you know, what do you sort of visualize and hope for in, in the months to come to seeing people come back and, and start to be able to enjoy these spaces more and to enjoy those festivals and, you know, those volleyball tournaments and things that that we normally see at Mooney's Bay. Yeah. I mean, thank you for acknowledging River Ward's uh, the green jewel that I like to call it with the McCarthy Woods and the Southern Corridor, the Rideau River. Uh, spine or corridor through the ward, and then you've got Booney's Bay, Hogsback, Vincent Massey, the farm, Carlington Woods. We're very, very fortunate in this ward. I'm a huge proponent of outdoor recreation, uh, particularly during COVID, I was having motions passed to promote getting people outside using our parks. Parks like Booney's Bay had, I think, uh, extreme uh, levels of, of visitors. We had an early spring last year and we saw uh, hundreds if not thousands of people in the park in April on weekends. So that posed some challenges because the park network really wasn't ready yet to uh, welcome that number of people. But I want people to get out in their parks. Mooney's Bay is not a, a neighborhood park. It's a regional park, probably yeah. half a million visitors a year. And um, there are a lot of amenities, so it's great. But we'll, by working with Parks and Rec, we really do need the infrastructure in this park. We need the, the pavilion. First of all, the pavilion needs to be rebuilt, but we can talk about that on another show. But you need washrooms open um, early in the season. You need staffing, public work staffing to clean up the park. The whole concern with families going into the water before the lifeguard season opens is a concern for me. But mm -hmm. listen, the, you don't have to travel to Gatineau Park or travel outside of Ottawa to enjoy the natural beauty. And because I have so many families that particularly don't have a lot of money to spend traveling or, or even to other more expensive uh, pursuits, they come to parks like Mooney's Bay. They come for hours. And you don't see a family of four, you see a family of 20 or 25 enjoying yeah. the park. And I love to see that. I absolutely yeah. love to see that. So, so yeah, we, we encourage people to get out and enjoy their local parks. Absolutely. And I find that, you know, the, the people that seem to take most advantage of uh, our green spaces, uh, quite quite frankly, are, are new Canadians, right? If I go by parks and, you know, if I go by Mooney's Bay, for instance, you mentioned that family of 20, oftentimes, you know, new Canadians enjoying those parks and, the, you know, taking advantage of it. it it's just, a, you know, a beautiful moment to see. I want to switch um, and talk a little bit more about uh, finances and economics. So, in, in your opinion, what's the biggest fiscal challenge in, in our municipality right now? Like within the city of Ottawa? Yeah, let's talk about the city of Ottawa in general. We've, we've spoken a lot about, you know, your specific ward, River Ward. But when you look at the, the city of Ottawa as a whole, what's the biggest fiscal challenge at the moment? Well, we have, as I alluded to earlier, a uh, infrastructure deficit in the city. When you look at work that needs to be done on our roads and sidewalks and bridges and our waterworks, that's all assessed on an annual basis. It gets triaged. The most critical uh, at need projects come to the top of the list as they should. Uh, the reason why the water bill rate is higher than the rate of inflation is because we still have critical projects that must be done in this city. If council is aware of critical projects uh, uh, that need to be done and we do not finance them and people get sick, contaminated water, we can go to jail. So there's a strong motivation in that front to keep our citizens safe. Um, but that list continues to grow, and I'm not referring to the water infrastructure list, but work on our roads and the infrastructure network. And that's why a few years ago, when the tax rate went from 2%, which it was the last term of council, to 3% this term, 1% was dedicated exclusively to infrastructure renewal and repair. So there's, there's money that already goes into that pot there's an extra 1%, it could probably be much higher. 
So I think that's the greatest challenge. Short term, there are some COVID ramifications as well. Some revenues that are coming in that will that will uh, disappear over time once we get out of COVID. But it's uh, infrastructure, and that includes you know the need for more housing to, to deal with our housing and homelessness crisis. But uh, it's just keeping pace with all the needs of, of infrastructure. Uh, we haven't touched on on businesses in in River Ward yet in in your community. Let's talk about you know some of the things. What are you hearing from local businesses, in particular uh, from small businesses uh, who are struggling uh, just mightily at the moment, Riley? Yes, yeah, I'm relied on on those of us who who went to work, whether it's the dry cleaners or other services. Uh, in River Ward, we're sort of outside the downtown core, serving more of, of the uh, residential communities. The uh, you know the, the yo-yo effect of of uh, proceeding with restrictions, lifting restrictions, uh, capacity limits has really hurt a number of businesses in my ward, not just restaurants but uh, other. Uh, businesses and um, we may not have a large commercial base compared to other wards. There are no BIAs, for example, but I've also tried to make our residents aware that these businesses ex exist. They're hurting. We need to support them in our local communities that before you go to a big box store that sells general merchandise, think about the contributions that our local businesses provide, the vibrancy of our neighborhoods, what would our neighborhoods be like without small businesses in them? And so it's really to try and remind residents uh, the importance of shopping locally, supporting these business owners. Many of the business owners live in the neighborhoods that they operate in and just encouraging that. But many are frustrated. Many have taken out loans to survive. Yeah. Um, and this is the psychological and, and emotional stress you can tell every time I, I pop in and, and chat with them. Riley, I've got about 90 seconds left here. Just wanted to touch on, you know, we've seen oftentimes a, a divided city council. We're obviously going to see some new faces. Um, what, what do you think the new mayor needs to do to sort of bridge some of that divide? At the very beginning, uh, she or he needs to bring us together. We need to get to know each other personally. We need to have a retreat. I know that's not popular with taxpayers, but you need to get us together and allow us to develop personal bonds with each other. And that will help us uh, work together professionally when some of the more controversial items come up. Despite uh, the fact that there are some personal friction on council, we are getting things done. Major things are right. getting done on this council. You're just seeing some of those personal challenges come out in the media or at council meetings. But I think at the very beginning, get us all together, talk about the roadmap we want to establish as a council. And really we need to facilitate those, those ways to work together, even if we disagree on substance. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that perspective because a lot of people see the divide oftentimes and they don't realize that that city council as a whole is oftentimes, you know, voting fairly positively on a, on a lot of different issues. And we just don't necessarily talk about that very often um, in the media or, you know, in, in other ways on social media and so forth. Riley, thanks so much for spending time with us. Really appreciate it. You've been watching Ward Updates 2022. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. invited me to die for it, and I RSVP'd yes, queen. I'm in. Thank you, soldier. You're gonna get us all killed. We only have about 24 hours to stop him. I bet your baby's life on it. MacGruber? I don't want Piper's baby to get murdered, or even die of natural causes, but that's how certain I am. 
Classic McGruber. McGruber, all new Sunday at 9, only on Showcase. Play four games.